salutations respected viewers here I am in front of the statue of King William the uh, third in London so who was William the third well he it was Stadtholder of the Netherlands that was ruler of the Netherlands as well as being more famous in this country for being the King of Ireland King of Scots and King of England he was born in the Netherlands to a family with distant uh, French and German ancestry because of their surname Orange Nassau indicates Orange, the town in the south of France, and Nassau in the middle of Germany. Um, so the Orange Nassau family, they had ruled the Netherlands for a few generations. However, they were not hereditary rulers. I mean, Stadtholder is a title, it's literally state holder. It wasn't president or prime minister, but equivalent to those. The 12 provinces of the Netherlands all had to choose who would be the Stadtholder. They chose him. It wasn't a fully democratic process. The propertied classes were allowed to vote. Um, anyway, he was a distinguished uh, military commander fighting against other countries, most notably France in the late uh, 17th century. Um, he married his first cousin, Mary. Uh, she was the daughter of King James II. Uh, so James II was ruling over here. Uh, James II uh, was a Catholic ruling a Protestant country. He succeeded to the throne in 1685. There was immediately an attempt to overthrow him by his uh, uh, illegitimate nephew, the Duke of Monmouth, who was defeated and executed. Anyway, um, here at Kensington Palace um, in uh, the autumn of 1788, a uh, baby was born um, to James II and his wife, Anne Hyde. But uh, was he uh, really the... Um, was this really their baby? Some people said this was a foundling smuggled in in a warming pan, couldn't be their child because there was a lot of anti-Catholic feeling at the time and many people had tried to prevent the succession of James II. Um, so uh, they could put up with him being a Catholic monarch for his lifetime but they feared that uh, then there would be a Catholic dynasty carrying on as he had a, as he had a son, a legitimate son. Um, so uh, then um, he uh, fled he got to the Thames and he brought the Royal, the Great Seal of England with him, which stamped on all documents to make them legal, and he dropped into the Thames, went to the bottom of the river and thought, they can't rule without me now because they don't have the Great Seal of England. And he was caught by some fishermen trying to sail away, James II, but then it was decided to release him, to let him go because once he left the country, he was deemed to have ab ad abdicated. The English Civil War had only been 40 years earlier. Um, and so people thought, oh, well, we don't want another civil war, that'd be incredibly bloody. Then we'll have levelers by the end, as in proto-communists. Um, so uh, James II, I think, was very ahead of his time, bringing the act of indulgence, the act of toleration, allowing uh, almost uh, equality for Christians of different denominations. And despite being an ardent Catholic himself, one of his dearest friends was William Penn, a Quaker, indeed, the, who was the founder of Pennsylvania, as it means Penn's Woods. So James II fled to France. He signed the secret treaty of Dover some uh, years before, uh, agreeing with King Louis XIV of France that uh, James II would reintroduce Catholicism as the state religion here as soon as the security of his throne allowed. Well, when would that be? Never, perhaps. Anyway, so uh, then the immortal seven, as in seven politicians, wrote the invitation to William, asking William of Orange to come over here to do various things, indeed investigate the circumstances of James II's putative son. Um, I say politicians, one of them was a lord, so five Tories, sorry, five, five Whigs and two Tories. Those are the informal political parties at the time. So he landed um, on uh, the uh, 5th of November, 1688 at Tor Bay in Devon, that's southwest England, um, and there's a there's a song about it landing at Tor Bay, and um, people pointed out it was a hundred years since the Spanish Armada. People claimed a Protestant wind had blown him here. It was a sign of divine favour. Remember, the Netherlands and England had been to war against each other thrice not long before the Anglo-Dutch Wars. So it was by no means certain that the Royal Navy would not oppose the sailing of the Dutch fleet. So he landed with thousands of soldiers. Hollanders, Swedes and so on, some black soldiers as well, as Macaulay writes in his History of England, all gorgeously comparisoned on their mighty war horses. And they were unopposed. There were no royalist troops to fight against him. Even people who'd supported James II against the Duke of Monmouth three years earlier took um, uh, William III's side and he came, he, walked, he came to London unopposed. So what was Parliament to do? He was married to his first cousin, Mary, as I said. Could they, should, should Mary rule in the place of her father, James II? Or should they have a king, uh, William III? It was difficult for a woman to be taken seriously. Though there had been female sovereigns um, in uh, the previous century. Anyway, Parliament decided there would be joint sovereigns. William III and his wife, 
Mary II would rule together. Um, so that was that. The glorious revolution, as some have called it, but the trouble is that very much militates against uh, values free history by according it a title such as glorious um, and it was it was supposedly glorious by those who advocated for it moreover almost nobody uh, in England was killed because of this there was some fighting in Scotland such as the Battle of Killiecrankie um, anyhow so that was that Parliament in England and Wales was four square behind him James II went from um, France to Ireland with French troops supplied by his bosom buddy Louis XIV and he took Dublin the Siege of Derry had commenced prior to um, the attempted overthrow of uh, James II. So these uh, people in Derry, the Protestant community there, they were the rebels. It was James II's men who were the loyalists. Let's get this straight. And I won't go into the Siege of Derry, but then there was the Battle of Boyne a couple of years later. The 1st of, of um, July, old style, 16... Um, uh, 90, but this now celebrated on the 12th of July 1690. I'll tell you what that is because in, in 1752 the English speaking world caught up with the um, uh, Gregorian calendar as we jumped forward um, uh, 11 days. Um, so that's that. Anyway, uh, James, William the Third and his wife, they ruled on. Uh, they had no children, which led to a uh, rumour going around after his death that he was a homosexual. I don't think there's any evidence of that. It wouldn't reflect any discredit on him these days if that were true, but only his enemies said that, so I don't think it is. Um, and he, I don't think he had any affairs either. Um, and his wife um, predeceased him, and then he died in 1702. Uh, what, anything about William III? He was a wise ruler. He, he conformed himself to the, to the customs of the country spoke a little bit of English, mainly resided here at Kensington Palace, and he recognised that Parliament must be supreme. Various acts were passed after him, um, like the Act of Settlement um, and so forth, and the supremacy of the Church of England was assured. He was not a man of anti-Catholic prejudice. He'd had Catholic allies, Catholic soldiers in his army at the Battle of the Boyne, and likewise there were some Protestants on the side of James II, who, even though they did not share his Catholicism, recognised that he was the uh, rightful monarch. Anyway, that's enough about William II, also commonly called William of Orange.